Good morning uh, from Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Anwar Bukhars, and I am a professor of counterterrorism and countering violent extremism at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I am also the lead faculty lead. Uh, I'm also the faculty lead of this academic program on effective community policing as a tool for countering violent extremism. Uh, this is a joint program that the Africa Center for Strategic Studies is convening with the Africa Center for the Study and Research of, uh, on Terrorism. Terrorism and, and violent extremism I mean, continue to be among the most significant challenges to peace and, and security in Africa. I mean, as terrorist and violent extremist groups, they establish new footholds in some of the continent's fragile states. And as tens of thousands of men and women formally affiliated with these violent extremist organizations. They return home or to areas under government control. We have seen that the military, the police, the gendarmerie, and the civilian law enforcement institutions are struggling to provide security and other public services. In some cases, we have seen that actions taken by defense and law enforcement personnel have aggravated the disconnect between state institutions and communities, and they have worsened the grievances that fuel violent extremism and terrorism. So the erosion of public trust in public security actors and in their capacity to provide a sense of security has in turn created security vacuums that a number of state and non-state actors scramble to fill. So in areas marked by the proliferation of militias and community vigilantes, we have seen that the under-resourced security sector and the ministries that oversee, it, they face the added challenge of how to manage these community self-defense groups in a way that they play constructive roles in their communities instead of further exacerbating violence and insecurity. So this state of affairs necessitates that African states, they step up their investments in the development of more effective, inclusive, and accountable security governance structures that are better suited uh, to, to local realities. And this is where community policing comes in. This is where the program comes in. I mean, community policing sits at the nexus between state security actors, local communities, and civil society. Unfortunately, you know, uh, it is a critical but often overlooked, it's under-resourced aspect of effective countering violent extremism. So effective community policing cannot be imposed simply as a strategy or a tactic for uh, countering violent extremism. Rather, as you will hear throughout this week, it's an ethos that must be infused into the culture and practice of security actors. Because the goal is to bridge the gap between security actors and the people and communities that they are bound to protect and to serve. And this requires a profound shift in countries especially those where, unfortunately, I mean, this ethos of serving the community, right, particularly those most vulnerable to violence is not at the core of security services present and active in society. The good news is that existent efforts on the part of defense and civilian law enforcement institutions in Africa to engage with local communities they show that approaches to collaborative security and community-oriented policing are not new to African states affected by terrorism and violent extremism. In fact, a number of African states struggling to contain the expansion of violent extremism and terrorism, we have seen have embraced community policing as a necessary complement to traditional policing practices. And in some cases, we have seen the potential benefits of improving existing policing practices, of expanding and adapting 
security approaches that build and rely on trust and collaboration between security forces, local government officials, and populations. Yeah. So consolidating the benefits of community policing, however, takes time, right? Uh, and continue with commitment. I mean, we're not naive. Community policing is not a silver bullet for preventing and countering violent extremism and terrorism, unless it is embedded in a holistic strategy that seeks to address the conditions that fuel violent extremism, you know, and terrorism, its benefits, uh, or its beneficial impacts, will, will remain uh, limited. So now we move into the, uh, the plenary session. That's where we have two speakers. Uh, session one is approaches to community policing and countering uh, <clears throat> violent extremism. And as I said earlier, you know, community policing has emerged as an important complement to traditional military and law enforcement responses, right? Uh, traditionally, counterterrorism practices have involved little consultation with local communities. You know, they have seldom taken into account communities' diverse needs, diverse concerns, diverse perceptions. Uh, the belief was that enforcement activities, intelligence gathering methods must take priority over that difficult task of gaining public trust, of earning the support of local communities. But the limitations of these methods have highlighted the necessity of drawing on the support of local communities to successfully tackle this problem or face to it, violent extremism and terrorism. In other words, communities must be stakeholders in the articulation and the provision of security, not just passive objects of law enforcement activities. And the logic behind this is quite simple, as you will hear. Yeah. In many low trust settings where policing is not closely integrated into local communities, where law enforcement agencies have little legitimacy and credibility the ability of security actors to identify and to enhance community safety issues and social order is undermined. By contrast, in areas where security actors, they adopt community-oriented approaches that prioritize public participation and support, we have seen that their efforts tend to have a positive impact. So naturally, there is not a one-size-fits-all uh, approach, right, to community policing, because context matters, as you will hear today. Each context has its own unique features. There has also to be realistic expectations about what community policing can accomplish, especially as it pertains to countering violent extremism. So community policing cannot act as a panacea to violent extremism, <clears throat> but it can help public confidence in and support for security actors, <clears throat> provided, of course, that communities are involved in the formulation and the implementation of locally tailored strategies. <clears throat> That's why we have called upon two distinguished and seasoned experts today to outline for us the basic principles and characteristics of community policing, to discuss the benefits of community policing, to examine the strategies that exist to implement community policing, approaches to preventing and countering violent extremism. <clears throat> uh, the first speaker uh, is Phyllis uh, Muma. Uh, she is currently the executive director of Kenya Community Support Center. Phyllis is a local practitioner in countering violent extremism with more than 10 years experience designing projects to respond to violent extremism drivers, working to build local capacities for community groups and civil society. Uh, Phyllis played an important role in the development of the draft Kenya National Peace Building and Conflict Management Policy. She played a critical role in the draft national, uh, draft national counter radicalization strategy. Phyllis is also a member of the Global 
Counterterrorism Forum, where she has provided community perspective. <clears throat> the second speaker is Dr. Emil uh, Wadrago. He's an adjunct professor here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. And prior to joining us, uh, uh, Dr. Wadrago served as Minister of Security of Burkina Faso from 2008 to 2011, where he initiated and developed a homeland security strategy. And he operationalized the concept of community policing and community participation in the management of security issues. Dr. Odrago was a parliamentarian in the National Assembly of Burkina Faso and the ECOWAS Parliament. So let's start with Phyllis here. <clears throat> I mean, Phyllis, in, in, in about you know, five minutes or so, you know, tell us, let's start first with defining community. What is community policing? I mean, what are the basic principles and characteristics of community policing? Phyllis? Yeah, hi, good afternoon. It's a good afternoon here in Kenya. Uh, I want first to start by thanking uh, uh, you for convening this meeting uh, and, and for bringing us together to share our experiences and also build uh, some policy recommendations moving forward. Uh, so my name is Phyllis Muema. I'm the Executive Director of Kenya Community Support Center. Uh, we're based in Kenya uh, on the coast, coast side of the country. So for us, community policing is a very important aspect of, of, of providing our own security. And uh, in Kenya, community policing is perceived and, and practiced as, as actually a strategy uh, towards enhancing citizen participation in improving uh, local security. Uh, it's, it's, it's community policing for us is not new. Uh, we, we, we've practiced community policing for a very long time. Uh, Kenya is coming from a history of police brutality, a situation where the police were actually hired to only uh, safeguard the state's interests and interests of politicians. And in a situation of a country like Kenya, which has experienced uh, local conflicts, uh, presence of local small arms, uh, and of course being a neighbor to countries like Somalia uh, and others which are experiencing turmoil, uh, Kenya as a country has really had a share of what we call uh, violation of human rights. And so community policing is something that we have struggled with for many years since 1990, when the communities came up and started, they want, said they wanted to be involved. They wanted to be part of security. Uh, and it didn't happen until 2002, when we had the general election and a new government was put in place. And one of the foundation uh, campaign for the government was that they were going to deal with the, uh, police reforms. And uh, sure enough, from 2002, uh, Kenya has experienced different forms of uh, policing. But I must say, uh, our principles of community policing is actually founded on the principles that policing is by consent uh, and not coercion. Uh, that police uh, service, uh, service uh, unit that are supposed to provide security to the people, and uh, people pay taxes uh, for the government provide security to them. Uh, and so we want to move from our experience of an, an, an oppressive uh, force to a service. Uh, we also say that uh, community policing for us is based on the principle of police working together with communities. The police being able to identify uh, security concerns and priorities of the communities that they serve. And more so, community policing is also tailored around meeting community needs and priorities. Uh, not, not, not state priorities, but community priorities. Uh, and that's what we've been uh, working around for the last almost 20, 30 years now, uh, to try and make sure that the police are actually serving the people. Community policing in Kenya is referred to as a partnership between the national police services and the local communities. Uh, here, the police are national uh, government uh, employees. Sorry. And, and police stations are, are, are located in all, all over the country. Uh, and in Kenya, experiences are different. And I'll be speaking about our experiences, especially in the, in the coastal region, which has experienced historic marginalization and state oppression over a very long time. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. I mean, the process of, 
of engagement, as, as you stated, is a critical component of any effective community policing initiatives. Uh, so, so engagement, you know, is not just about organizing a, a meeting with community members, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a complex process that demands sensitivity, demands careful planning. So, so a clumsy or careless approach to policy community engagement, as you know, can be more detrimental than non-engagement at all. So when, when considering policy, uh, uh, police community engagement to prevent terrorism in the Kenya context here, right? I mean, several questions arise. First is, is why? Uh, I mean, with whom, right? And, and how should this engagement take place between obviously security actors and communities? So that, how do you do it? I mean, with whom do you do it? Thank you. So uh, I, I, I want to say that uh, community policing in Kenya has grown. Uh, initially, it was uh, established to deal with the community security concerns, basically about crime, uh, burglary, carjacking, and, and, and neighborhood security. But uh, in, in, in 2011, uh, we began experiencing terrorist, terrorist attacks in Kenya, and it became very important that uh, police realized that they really needed to work with communities. I, I can tell you the attacks that happened in Kenya initially were perpetrated by people who had lived in communities, people who had spent time in communities. People even prior to the attack were seen around by the communities. But because of the bad relationship and mistrust between police and communities, uh, they could not even allow the, 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 you know, the citizens to go near a police station and report what they had seen. And so over time, we have learned that uh, community policing is not just a strategy coming from the national government. It must be localized. It must be uh, something that is driven by the local communities. And for community policing to, to, to work very well, we have realized that the role of women the role of women is very critical uh, because women are a lot of information and women have a very specific role, especially in our communities. Uh, and women must be included. The youth must play a role. Uh, the people with disability, uh, disabilities actually have played very key roles in Kenya, uh, especially on, on, on information sharing. However, uh, Kenya has within its constitution uh, formalized community policing and has given guidelines on how community policing needs to be structured. Uh, I must say, even when we have it in our legal uh, frameworks, we, and we also have a national task force that is uh, obligated to ensure that community policing works. But I can tell you it works differently in different places and sometimes it doesn't function at all. Uh, in fact, even when it has been uh, mandated that a local police officer in charge of a police station ensures that he mobilizes or she mobilizes communities to participate. It doesn't happen in many, in many areas because the mistrust is still there. The people don't trust government. People don't want to be forced to be informants. People don't want to be turned against each other uh, or, or just become spies on each other. Uh, so engagement will mean open communication uh, driven by community local needs. And so communities must identify uh, the priorities that they would like the police to, to, to address. And the police cannot impose and they should not impose uh, their demands. Many times in Kenya, you find community police being formed and there are demands that people must provide information to the police and not the other way around. And so the way it is worked, it is structured is that communities are supposed to organize and form their own committee, which must include women, religious leaders, the youth, all, 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 all sectors of the community must be part of this. And when they meet at the police station, it is structured that the community members, the civilians, must be the chair of, of that uh, community policing forum, which is formed. And then the police officer in charge of a police station becomes a core, a core chair. Uh, and of course, uh, officers who are in charge of uh, intelligence are the secretaries to that committee. And it must meet monthly. Uh, people must come monthly to first provide information and get feedback from police. We, we, we provide information to the police. We expect feedback. What happened with the information that we shared? How far is it, even if it's a court case? But what we see in, in, in reality and uh, in practice is that the police only use community policing structures to receive information. There is very little feedback that's coming to communities. And that 
increases uh, mistrust. Unfortunately for Kenya, even when we are very working uh, community policing structures, if we get an attack from terrorists, the game changes. You know, we have seen members of community policing even being arrested when they are actually supposed to be allies, uh, especially in the mass in, 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 in the mass arrests. Everybody needs to be there, but currently it is only left as a goodwill of the officers at the police station. So we lack political goodwill. We lack political goodwill even from the senior police officers who must be ensuring that the junior officers at the police station level set up uh, these forums that are supposed to bring communities closer to the police. Uh, so in our experience, uh, that's what we have seen. Uh, we cannot say it, it is not working. It has worked a lot. It has enabled police to receive information from the population. It has enabled police to walk freely in communities which were initially very hostile. Uh, however, the trust gap is still there and it's something that we must work on. But again, uh, in Kenya, community policing is not resourced. So it is left to the goodwill of the communities, the people around there to fund the activities of community policing. And that makes it very unsustainable. Uh, our government does not provide the resources uh, to ensure that community policing works and that people own police stations and people feel these police stations are having the interest and not the interest of the state. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Phyllis. Uh, so again, that, you know, it, it, absolutely right. I mean, a local approach to preventing and countering violent extremism is, is necessary, as, as we have heard. I mean, communities, uh, uh, so, so community-oriented approaches, in, as you have described in, in Kenya, that are successful, they have sought the involvement, the uh, support and the trust, right, of, of men and women from local communities uh, in, 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 in implementing, you know, community policing. I don't know whether that happened also in the formulation, in the implementation, in the evaluation of counterterrorism measures to increase that effectiveness, uh, or 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 not. Uh, so if you can if you can address that that point uh, quickly, whether communities have been involved in the formulation uh, and also in the implementation, and whether there was any evaluation of these counterterrorism measures to increase their their effectiveness in the context of of, of Kenya. Thank you very much. Uh, as you are aware, Kenya uh, formulated its first national strategy for countering violent extremism in 2016. Uh, the formulation of this action plan, uh, this strategy, uh, then opened the doors for counties at the local level to formulate what we call the county action plans. And uh, th these action plans have been spearheaded by civil society organizations in Kenya. They have brought everybody together, and, and basically this is the only opportunity that we have seen the national government letting communities and civil society to provide key roles in, in identifying the key drivers of radicalization and recruitment to terrorism. And so each county has been able, has been given the opportunity, uh, and I have been part of most of the action plans in the course of Kenya, where civil society we are left to, to lead. And so we have an opportunity to mobilize all sectors, uh, women, the youth, uh, you know, the, everybody in the community, religious leaders, indigenous community leaders, uh, cultural leaders, to come together and reflect on what uh, the terrorist threat means to them and what are the drivers and how they can work jointly with the government to address uh, the, some of the drivers and the pull and push factors that push people to terrorism. And I must say, this is a classic example for Kenya. Uh, every county now has its annual action plan and we have an opportunity to meet quarterly together with the, the county security and intelligence committee uh, led by the county commissioners, the civil society and members of the community to reflect on the threat and, and how they can come up to, uh, with, with actions. So every quarter we meet and every year we are also sharing our reports with the National Counterterrorism Center uh, just to show what efforts communities are doing. And in this way, uh, we've been able to actually reduce uh, to a large extent the threat of terrorism and recruitment in our counties. 
Uh, currently, as you can see, we have had a calm, we are experiencing calmness in Kenya because every county, the communities are at the center of prevention. And I think this is the best way to go. Uh, it's, still, it's still a work in progress, but we, we are very excited about the new model. And I, we, in this model, community policing continues to play a very critical role because they link the community and the police. The community policing members are drawn from community members. They understand the communities very well. They understand even change of behaviors amongst the, the, the you know, members of the community. And they can advise police on the best action to take. So these days we are seeing more intelligence-led arrests and not the way the police used to blanket, uh, condemn the entire community when there is an attack. And, and I think it's a good thing. We look forward to sharing experiences yeah. because it's a very new concept, but maybe by next year we shall be seeing the results of the county action plans. Excellent. Uh, th thank, thank you, Phyllis. Again, the emphasizing here the, uh, the idea that terrorism, you know, violent extremism are, are threats to community security and that communities uh, are stakeholders because the threat is not just to state security, but to community security. So communities are stakeholders and partners here, uh, all the way from the national level to the obviously local level. And, and that's, we will delve uh, deeper into that in session, session three. So communities are not just a passive object of law enforcement uh, uh, tactics. Uh, you know, this, Phyllis, <clears throat> this might be self-evident, right? But what happens in, and, and just tell us here, and again, this might be self-evident, why does it matter? I mean, if individuals and communities do not trust their security providers, just briefly, why does it matter? In Kenya, we have had very, very live examples of, of the impact that the country has faced, especially in the face of mistrust between police and communities. Uh, we have seen uh, not just as the, the state security system suffering, but even the community suffers a lot. Uh, anytime there was an attack in this country, uh, I can tell you the, the, the region where I am based, uh, businesses are closed. Thousands of youth have been laid off and families suffer economically. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is a heavy presence of security and people feel like their privacy is, is, is being interfered with. And, and on the contrary, when we, we, we partner with the, with, with the state security and, and the community policing, it's different. You know, people feel free. They feel like they're in a democratic, in a democratic country. You can invest, you can, you, you can work freely. And for us, it matters a lot that communities are active participants. They are stakeholders. They are not just beneficiaries of security. Uh, and, and they must be part of every step of plan and because they are the ones who suffer they are at the center of prevention uh, without communities we are not going to win the war on terrorism because they are the best defense against terrorism they understand their children they are able to see change behavior they can see recruiters and they understand that uh, okay. can you hear me now Yes. Yes, we thank can you. hear you. Thank you, Ron. Thank, thank you. So I'm saying it matters a lot uh, because people need to feel secure. And many times it is communities who have lost uh, in this war on terrorism and in these acts of terror. Because when children are recruited and they go, uh, the family feels the pain forever. And we have people who are traumatized to date, people who don't know where their kids are, and, and either uh, people disappear, either they've been recruited by terrorists or they have been arrested by our own uh, security officials. And I can tell you it is at the heart of community. So it matters a lot that people become central and they play key role in, in ensuring their own neighborhood security uh, and, and that by extension uh, ensure state security. So it matters a lot, it's important. However, <coughs> communication must be open and people must be valued as key partners. In fact, they are central to any community policing strategy. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. And lastly, I mean, you have addressed this uh, more or, or less. Uh, I mean, what strategies exist to translate community policing into, into practice? You can add the, to what you, you already stated. Sorry. 
I have I have technology issues. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was what was the question? <laughs> sure. The, you know, you address this more or less that asking about what strategies exist. You know, to translate all these practices. You know, community policing into practice. Well, there, there, there are very many initiatives happening in Kenya. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, every locality is unique yeah. and uh, applies different uh, strategies. But currently, uh, the communities are very much aware about their, their, their right to security, their right to you know, protection, <clears throat> and, and more so protection of human rights. Uh, our constitution provides for citizen participation uh, not just in development, but also in security. And therefore, at this moment, we, we, we have had a lot of uh, community mobilization happening and, and asking police to stand at account. Uh, it's now working. In many areas, the police are also aware that they are serving a population that needs service, that needs to be protected, uh, a population whose rights are a priority, uh, and, and a population whose access to information is also a right. And so it's happening now in Kenya in many areas. Uh, we have been community policing coming up. Uh, however, like I said, we still have the challenges. Unless we have a proper legal framework that, that actually provides how community policing should work, how accountability must be done, and uh, how you know monitoring can be done, we still have a challenge in Kenya. It has not been done. Uh, the country drafted a draft policy to guide community policy. And I can tell you almost 10 years down the line, that policy has not been adopted. And therefore, yes. initiatives that are here are just ad hoc, uh, just trying to interpret what the law says and what it means. But in many areas, especially in the rural areas, the communities are beginning to see the value of working with the police. And the police, by extension, have, have begun appreciating that the communities can really help them uh, provide the service easily, they can get the right information at the right time, and they can provide security as needed only if they perceive communities as active partners, but not just beneficiaries. And they cannot impose yes. community policing. <clears throat> People yeah. must be willing to participate. Yes. Okay, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Uh, uh, we have heard Phyllis talk about the key principles of community policing, basically that. The police and security actors, you know, should, you know, they should engage, they should mobilize, they should partner with communities. How they, she gave concrete examples of how, you know, security actors and the police they listen to communities' concerns, they respond to communities' needs, uh, they respect and protect the rights of community members, and, and most importantly, they need to be accountable for their outcome, uh, for their actions, right, and the outcome of these actions. So. Uh, you know, police engagement, uh, security sector engagement with the public, as Phyllis uh, has stated, should be inclusive, should reach out to all communities, and it uh, should reach to a cross section of, of, of members within communities, including, as she said, at the grassroots level, women, you know, uh, youth, uh, <clears throat> etc. So with that, we turn to our second speaker, uh, distinguished uh, Dr. Emil uh, Drago. Uh, I mean, Emil, based on, on your experience, I mean, how and, and, and to what extent can community policing contribute to preventing violent extremism and terrorism? Emil. Uh, merci beaucoup, Anwar. Alors, uh, je voudrais encore à mon tour donc remercier le, le CAIART de l'Union africaine et le César et pour l'opportunité donc euh, qu'ils nous offrent, qu'ils offrent au cadre, au cadre africain du secteur de la sécurité, pour pouvoir échanger et partager sur euh, une thématique euh, d'actualité, une thématique euh, très pertinente, qui est donc euh, celle donc de la participation communautaire pour relever les défis euh, de, des problèmes de sécurité donc euh, en Afrique. Donc, euh, à la suite de, de Félix, Félix a vraiment bien planté le décor de cette session. Cette session donc, qui porte sur euh, les approches euh, sur la police de proximité et la lutte contre le terrorisme. Et je crois qu'elle a si bien fait le travail que euh, sera facile pour moi donc de pouvoir euh, emboîter son pas. 
et sur d'autant plus renforcé qu'elle à partir des expériences kenyanes, elle a pu en tout cas toucher certains aspects donc, que je vais aborder, dont la contribution de la force de proximité dans la prévention et la lutte contre le terrorisme. Donc, merci. Euh, donc, je disais que je ne vais pas répéter ce que Félix a si bien dit. Et je ne vais pas aussi partager l'expérience de Burkina, comme vous l'avez compris. Mais c'est sûr qu'avec le, les expériences qu'on va sûrement partager, et nous allons pouvoir sortir grandi de, de ce séminaire. Donc, je vais renforcer ces propos à certains endroits. Et je dirais d'ailleurs que la police de proximité, comme elle a si bien dit, c'est d'abord, c'est défini d'abord comme étant le, un modèle de gestion de la sécurité. Un modèle de gestion de la sécurité qui est axé sur la participation de la communauté. Parce qu'en Afrique, donc, on avait essentiellement des polices, des forces de sécurité publique beaucoup plus réactives et répressives. Des, des forces de police qui étaient mobilisées pour les missions, des missions de maintien de l'ordre. Une police qui était beaucoup plus... Maintenant, nous allons donc essayer de faire ce, 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 cette transition et aller vers une police donc, plus préventive, une police plus anticipatrice et qui coproduit la sécurité avec les communautés. Donc euh, là-dessus, je crois que le, le, la police de proximité ne peut être que l'approche la plus appropriée pour pouvoir donc euh, euh, lutter contre tous les défis sécuritaires. Et donc pour revenir à, à ta question, je dirais que la police de proximité, est, dans ses contributions, comme je l'ai dit, comme c'est un modèle axé sur donc, euh, la, la gestion de la sécurité publique et avec la, la communauté. Pour moi, donc, elle ne peut être, elle peut être l'outil idéal, l'outil donc idoine pour la réduction donc, des crimes et aussi pouvoir relever les défis sécuritaires. Alors, ce qui concerne donc l'extrémisme violent, donc pour reprendre précisément, la police de proximité, à mon avis, est un outil qui permettra d'abord d'enraciner et d'inculquer les valeurs du respect des droits de l'homme et de l'état de droit par les forces de sécurité publique. Là, c'est extrêmement important et je crois que Félix l'a dit. Et nous sommes dans de, beaucoup de pays en Afrique où euh, le respect des droits de l'homme, le respect donc de l'état de droit, et reste encore euh, des défis à, à relever. Et la police de proximité pourrait contribuer à pouvoir donc euh, et enraciner et inculquer ces valeurs. Et aussi comme contribution, la police de proximité pourra donc améliorer la perception et aussi l'interaction entre les forces de sécurité publique, qui est d'ailleurs la condition sine qua non, pour un soutien effectif. Pour avoir un soutien effectif de la population et des communautés, il faut donc une bonne perception d'abord des forces de, défense, des forces de sécurité par la population et ensuite et donc euh, faciliter l'interaction entre ces forces et la population. Et c'est à ce prix donc, que nous pourrons donc, euh, avoir un soutien effectif à la lutte et à la prévention contre l'extrémisme violent et le terrorisme. Et un autre aspect, c'est la communication. Nos forces de défense et de sécurité, comme vous le savez très bien, il y a des lacunes au niveau de la communication, et la police de proximité pourra donc euh, corriger ce, ce déficit de communication et pourra favoriser la sensibilisation sur le terrorisme et l'extrémisme violent. Ça pourra ensuite, par la suite, renforcer la vigilance et la résilience de la population face au terrorisme. Et enfin, le dernier point, et pas le moindre, ça pourra améliorer la connaissance des communautés par rapport à la défense et de sécurité. Vous arrivez souvent, on vous envoie dans un, dans un patelin, dans un, dans un coin traviculé où vous ne connaissez pas du tout les valeurs culturelles, les réalités donc, de, de ce milieu. Et cela euh, complique davantage donc, euh, la mise en œuvre, euh, l'exécution de votre mission. Donc voici quelques aspects, quelques points positifs que euh, la police de proximité pourrait donc, euh, contribuer donc, à, à, à la lutte contre l'extrémisme euh, violent. Excellent, uh, uh, Emile. And again, you have heard how it's critical to anchor policing into respect for the rule of law, for human rights. Uh, Emile talked about how community policing can help reduce the potential violations of human rights, how the undermining of the rule of law, you know, might otherwise fuel the uh, 
experiences and alienation in certain segments of the, of the population. Uh, so, uh, uh, Emile, I mean, what, you know, and, and, and this is, you know, follows from what you just said, what knowledge and skills do security actors as a whole require to be effective in, in helping to counter uh, violent extremism? Uh, merci. À moi, comme je l'ai dit, le, le, les valeurs de respect des droits de l'homme et aussi euh, le respect donc, de, de l'état de droit m'amène à dire que en fait, l'objectif ultime de la police de proximité, on viendra avec moi, c'est de servir donc, la, la, la communauté, assurer la protection des biens, ça c'est des missions traditionnelles de la police et de, 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 de la gendarmerie, protection des biens et des personnes, et bien sûr, donc, la commune tout entière. Je l'ai dit, malheureusement, les forces de défense et de sécurité, dans la plupart de nos pays, et quand bien même vous avez des missions, par exemple, de visite de quartier que les gendarmeries ont ah, dans ces missions euh, normales, ces, ces forces de, de défense, ces forces de sécurité publique ont été formatées initialement et formées pour protéger primordialement l'État. Et dans cette quête de protection de l'État et des intérêts de la sécurité nationale, elles le font souvent au détriment, malheureusement au détriment, donc de, 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 de la population qu'elle est censée et parfois donc protéger et défendre. Et donc je pense qu'une police donc de proximité effective et efficace euh, repose donc sur une confiance mutuelle et un partenariat solide avec la population. Et pour pouvoir atteindre ces objectifs, je crois que nous devons voir aussi bien au niveau de l'État, ce qu'il faudrait corriger, et aussi au niveau de la déontologie même des forces de sécurité, euh, des forces de sécurité publique. Donc, la sécurité dans un État, si nous sommes d'accord que c'est la sommation de tous les efforts faits dans le sens d'obtenir la paix et la stabilité et à l'intérieur de, 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 de cet État, il faut quand même noter que cette situation restera tributaire des, des, des facteurs essentiels. Et comme je l'ai dit, l'enracinement de l'état de droit, la bonne gouvernance, ne pourront jamais, et sont des conditions, des prérequis pour pouvoir mettre en œuvre une bonne police donc, de, de, de proximité. Et je prendrai l'exemple de, de, de certains répentis, de certains répentis, et pour vous montrer à, euh, comment est-ce que ces éléments sont extrêmement importants. Je sais qu'une étude a été faite par ASS au Mali, auprès de certains répentis, donc euh, terroristes euh, répentis, le témoignage était quand même assez illustratif. Il y a un qui dit, là où moi j'ai perdu mes biens parce que je n'ai pas d'argent pour donner au juge. Le système est complètement corrompu. Donc voici pourquoi j'ai décidé de rejoindre le groupe euh, 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 terroriste. Et un autre, du Mijao, le Mijao donc, qui a été dissous et ensuite conformé avec un sardine et ensuite avec euh, Al-Qaïda euh, au Maghreb islamique, un répandu en 2016 qui disait que euh, c'est en écoutant leurs paroles, en les écoutant parler, ils m'ont convaincu, le Mujao bien sûr, ils m'ont convaincu de leur intégrité et de leur approche de la justice. Donc cela était suffisant pour moi pour pouvoir les rejoindre pour cette cause. Et enfin, une étude qui a été faite par le programme des Nations Unies pour le développement, qui a été faite d'ailleurs dans euh, au Kenya, donc dans le pays de Philis, au Nigeria et en Somalie. Et cette, euh, cette étude a concerné euh, 500 entretiens avec les djihadistes. Laissez-moi vous dire que dans, cette étude a révélé que dans plus de 70% des cas, l'élément déclencheur de leur enrôlement, de l'enrôlement euh, des, des djihadistes, était un acte dû à l'État, tel que l'arrestation ou l'exécution d'un proche. Et c'est extrêmement important donc, que nous puissions savoir cela. Et au niveau donc, de la déontologie, il faudrait donc que euh, peut-être euh, certaines valeurs reviennent. Et c'est extrêmement important pour moi ici de noter que les services de sécurité, malheureusement en Afrique, ont la réputation d'être souvent très peu fréquentables, souvent violents et souvent indexés pour des cas de torture, arrestation arbitraire, corruption et manque de professionnalisme. Alors, au Burkina Faso, on a une organisation de la société civile qu'on appelle le Réseau National de Lutte contre la Corruption, le RENLAC. Cette association fait annuellement 
euh, une publication sur l'indice de perception de la corruption au Burkina Faso. Et je peux vous dire que depuis plus d'une de, dizaine d'années, les forces de sécurité occupent les premières places. Donc, si vous avez donc des forces de sécurité qui sont identifiées et qui sont reconnues comme étant corrompues, c'est extrêmement difficile de pouvoir donc euh, pouvoir euh, avoir la confiance et pouvoir faire le rapprochement avec euh, la, la, la population. Donc, sous le prétexte souvent aussi de la lutte contre le terrorisme, euh, les forces de défense de sécurité et faut souvent on recourt donc aux, aux exécutions extrajudiciaires, la brutalité. Et je peux donc vous dire que et les récentes manifestations que nous avons constatées au Nigeria euh, illustrent exactement ce que donc j'ai dit. Et la SAS, par exemple, qui était la brigade anticriminalité, et qui était initialement créée pour lutter contre des vols à main armée, par exemple au Nigeria, que je connais très bien, est aujourd'hui accusée donc de, viol de, de violation des droits humains, de corruption, de torture. Je peux vous dire que ce qui se passe au Nigeria, n'est pas loin de ce qui passe, et se passe dans, 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 tous les, dans beaucoup de pays en Afrique. La grande majorité des sites de sécurité chargés du renforcement de la loi en Afrique sont dans les mêmes dispositions d'esprit et de comportement de la, de la SARS au Nigeria. Donc, je voudrais simplement dire qu'il faut qu'on revienne à certaines valeurs. Valeurs d'abord au niveau de l'État, au respect de l'État, et ensuite au niveau donc de la déontologie et de l'éthique professionnelle, l'intégrité, la justice l'impartialité de la culture pourrait donc être des éléments nécessaires. Thank you, Emile. Uh, Emile, there are some, some inherent risks that uh, the police and the security sectors you know, should, should be aware of and they, they should try to minimize uh, when, when applying community policing approaches. You know, there's in some cases over-reliance on stigmatizing particular communities, securitizing the relationship with the communities, using community policing to spy on. And can, you, can you talk a little bit about, about that, I mean, given your, your experience and, and the context, obviously, uh, that you know? Emile? Yeah, merci, merci Anwar. Alors, c'est extrêmement important de parler donc le lien qui est entre la police de proximité et aussi euh, les services de renseignement. Et je peux ici dire que la police de proximité et les services de renseignement sont deux vases communicants. Et c'est une interaction donc euh, entre deux, deux systèmes, mais qui, qui se complètent et, et qui sont complémentaires. Alors, ce qu'il faut peut-être retenir, hein, c'est de l'expérience que je connais. C'est depuis nos questions, donc, la protection des sources. Euh, je peux vous dire que euh, si les dispositions ne sont pas prises pour, euh, ne, pas, pour ne pas exposer les citoyens, les groupes de communauté, parce que si vous appliquez mal la police de proximité, les citoyens, des groupes, des communautés peuvent être euh, stigmatisés. Et quand elles sont stigmatisées, elles s'exposent à la vindicte et aux représailles euh, de, de certains groupes euh, armés terroristes et qui les identifient souvent d'ailleurs comme des, des, des collabos. Et je peux vous dire que dans le cas du Burkina Faso, beaucoup de membres de structures communautaires qui font partie du système dispositif de police, de police de proximité, beaucoup de citoyens, et dans le cadre des initiatives locales de sécurité, ont payé et continuent de payer le prix fort de leur vie pour cette collaboration. Donc je pense que dans la mise en œuvre de la police de proximité, il faudrait donc travailler à ne pas stigmatiser euh, un groupe et il faut faire en sorte que euh, des gens ne puissent pas être euh, identifiés et, voilà, et exposés à la vindicte euh, des groupes terroristes. Thank you, uh, thank you, Emile. Uh, we, you know, we have heard the, uh, uh, you know, the principles, the characteristics of community policing, uh, uh, how you know, the, the importance of improving public perceptions and interactions with the police and security sectors and, and how public support for, for, for counterterrorism action of the police, you know, hinges on how the public perceive and interact with the police and security sectors. So public trust in the security, you know, sector or the police is not only a desired outcome of community policing, 
but as we have heard from the New York Phillies, you know, it's it's a precondition for its success. I mean, all members of the community, men and women, must believe that efforts to address, you know, their common security concerns are genuine, that dialogue with the security actors is possible, you know, that their rights is respected before they even consider doing it. And then Emil here, you know, warned us of some of the risks of, uh, of over-reliance on community police, using community police to just spy, you know, on, on individuals. Intelligence-led policing and community policing are complementary, as Emil said. They are mutually supportive, but at the same time, they are distinct approaches. Yes, community policing can facilitate the sharing of information, uh, but uh, it can help identify, uh, it can help the police identify, prioritize, and tackle issues. But nonetheless, these are two distinct uh, approaches. Uh, so, uh, with that, you know, the presentations uh, come to an end, uh, the moderated discussion finished.